if uh, you have any issues, uh, please let me know. So today we'll be discussing the distributed transactions and especially Saga. And my name is Bogdan. I am senior software engineer here in the SoftServe. Uh, working here um, in the Lviv, um, especially in the SoftServe for uh, one year. Before that, I was working in another uh, smaller company actually for another five plus years. Um, so first of all, let's take a quick look at the agenda of today's presentation. As a first step, we'll um, remind ourselves a bit about the transactions in general and the asset. After that, we'll see the differences between the microservices and monolith um, in terms of the transactions. We'll take a look at the traditional way to solve the issue with the uh, distributed transactions in the microservices. And finally, we'll reach the main point of the presentation, presentation which is um, the saga. At the end, we'll have some time uh, for the questions and answers after the small uh, saga example. So uh, yeah, well, let's start. A database transaction in general, and you uh, may also know that is a sequence of operations uh, which are performed as a single unit of work. So basically all or nothing. Uh, for example, we have a ticket vendor service. Uh, so basically we are providing the tickets to the users and Alice is trained to buy a ticket. We have a two, probably two tables, one to manage the amount of money for the users and the second one is to manage the ticket. And we wanna make sure that we provide the ticket only in the case when we charge the money from the, from the user. Sorry. Also, it's uh, very unlike uh, situation when we are providing a ticket without uh, charging the money. Or uh, for example, if we charge the money without providing a, a, a ticket. So in this case, we are using the, uh, the tr transaction itself. So uh, when we are talking about the transactions, we also keeping in mind the asset. Um, so a quick reminder about that too. The density means that um, for each transaction, uh, that each transaction is actually a single unit. Uh, so if, uh, if in any case, one of the statements uh, in that transaction fails, then the entire transaction will also fail. So um, the um, the, the transaction itself will, is left unchanged. If you're talking about the consistency, it ensures that transaction can only bring the database from one consistent state to another consistent state. Um, isolation helps us in the case when we have a multiple concurrent tr uh, transactions. So basically it makes sure that um, the, the result database will remain the same if um, the transactions were executed sequentially. And also you remember, if you have experience with the MySQL database, for example, we can control that by using it isola uh, isolation levels. Um, yeah. um, and the last one is the durability. So basically it guarantees that if the transactions uh, has been committed, it will remain committed even in the case of any exceptional situation such as or outgages or a, a crash. And that looks obvious and familiar for you guys, I'm sure. And it actually is in case when we have the monolithic architecture. On the left side of the screen, you can see that we have a, a simple service with the UI business logic data access layer and some kind of database. And it works fine until we get some additional requirements to the service. And mostly a lot of today's um, modern uh, services, modern startups are having some additional requirements to the scalability, for example, or they have like a huge team, multinational teams. Um, some startups want to combine different um, technologies, different, different languages to build a project. So there are a lot of, um, current services that are built using the microservice architecture. For example, using the Kubernetes clusters with the services with multiple instances, multiple ports. It can be uh, some services may, be, may have built using the Java language, the rest of them Ruby, for example, or .NET technologies. Also, we can combine using this approach a different type of databases for uh, different purposes. 
so how do we ma maintain the cons that data consistency between all of those microservices? Because uh, we can have, uh, if we are getting back to the example with the Alice and the ticket vendor, we can have users in the one table and the tickets in the in, in the another. We want to make sure that we have the user ID from one database. We want to make sure that we have the same user ID in the in the next database. So let's take a look at the quick example. Um, here we have four different microservices, basically the same idea of uh, ticket placement. Uh, the first microservice is basically just an order uh, order service. Uh, the consumer service is responsible for to check the consumer information, maybe some username, user ID, and so on. Ticket service uh, speak, speaks basically for for, for itself, um, just to place an order or, or create a ticket. And the last one, account service, is responsible to check the credit card information, authorize the user, check if the, that credit card is valid, maybe if um, the user has enough balance on, on it. So we more want, uh, want to make sure that the data is consistent between um, all of those four uh, services. For example, when we create a ticket in the kitchen service, we want to make sure it has the order ID from the order service. And also we don't want to have an order uh, completed in the order service in case uh, when the um, accounting service uh, fails to uh, validate the card or card is not valid or there are no um, enough money on the on the account so how do we keep that data consistent so the traditional approach to solve that issue um, basically to maintain the data consistency between the microservices between the microservices is um, actually distributed transactions, especially here we are talking about the XA compliant technology stack. So it consists with the uh, different types of uh, X, uh, XA compliant databases, message brokers, database drivers, and all of those provides you a way to, to keep one global transaction between the microservices. And most of the SQL databases, SQL databases are XA compliant, as uh, also some of the message brokers. So the main ad advantage of this approach is basically you are having the same ACID transaction as you used to have with the monolith and uh, application with the one database. And everything seems to be working fine, but there are, uh, but there are some huge disadvantages with, um, with that traditional approach. So the first disadvantage is, um, so as I already mentioned, the great advantage of the microservices approach is that we can combine different, different technologies and different approaches in our system. So um, for example, we may have, uh, we may use uh, Cassandra database to store, to store transactions, or we may use uh, Redis cache. Um, we can maybe combine different languages, as I mentioned, Java, .NET, and so on. We can use Kafka in some cases, in other cases, RabbitMQ. So the, the first and uh, the first huge disadvantage of the traditional approach is the distributed transaction size, actually, that many modern technologies doesn't support um, XA uh, technology. Uh, so um, that may be a huge uh, limitation huge uh, restrictions uh, for, for your projects. Also another uh, disadvantage is that it uses actually two-phase commit, which is a blocking protocol. So for example, we have five different microservices and we need to execute some transactions that consist of, um, that involves uh, five of those microservices. So for the first transaction to be uh, commit, it needs to wait for the last one. Um, and this process actually reduces uh, availability significantly because, for example, if we have um, availability, um, each of those services is available for 99.9% of, of the time. The, and the common availability score for this system will be around 95% already. If you have more services, that score will be even lower for that. And that might be critical for the modern applications 
when we have like a, a huge amount of microservices, uh, when we want to make sure that the uh, service is uh, available uh, most of the time. Uh, so how to solve that issue to have something, some technology to have to keep the data consistent in the microservice architecture and also to keep the services um, available. Um, so uh, let me introduce you Saga. Um, so that's basically an approach that which allows you to maintain the data consistency using a sequence of uh, local transactions and async uh, messaging. So here we have the same example with the order uh, consumer kitchen and the accounting service. And to create an order, we need to complete six um, different transactions. First, we need to create an order, then verify a customer, create, create a ticket, a rice card, a brew ticket, and approve order. So how does uh, actually Saga works, works in this case and actually maintains the consistency? So first of all, we need to create uh, an order in the order service, probably with some temporary state um, order, pending order, or pending order, order state, for example. After that, we need to send uh, an event to the message queue. Let's say a Kafka, or if we are talking about AWS, it can be SQS. That, um, so we need to send an event to the consumer service queue to, nif to notify that service that the customer needs to be notified. We can also provide uh, some order information, maybe some information from the authorization uh, about the user, probably role or user ID, doesn't matter. Um, then the consumer service can get that message from the queue, verify a customer, and then put another event message um, into the kitchen service queue to create a ticket and so on. So basically with this approach, we are maintaining a queue, uh, sorry, a consistency using, uh, a, using a, a queues. So even in the case when some of the services will fail or one of the pods fails, after the, the start, that service will be able to pick the message from the queue and continue uh, continue um, execution of this uh, um, of this saga. Um, so that's actually another benefit because um, if you remember about the um, discussion about the distributed transaction and XA, in case when we have, for example, Q Kubernetes with a number of pods, when one of the pods fails, um, the, actually this distributed the transaction won't be able to complete. And even if, if we have at this point, um, another pod available that can pick the message, um, it doesn't work for the distributed transaction. In this case, if even one of the instances of, of the same service, for example, consumer services fails, the, the next in, instance can, can pick that message from the, from the queue and continue um, the SACA process. Um, so, yeah, it uh, looks consistent, right? Because we have services, we have some messages and making sure that we are not losing messages because um, even if the case, in the case of the SQS, it's, it's a highly available service. Um, or if you're talking about the Kafka, it also um, di distributes the, the data. Um, but uh, what if, for example, on the step number four, transaction will fail? Uh, for some reason. Uh, with the traditional um, asset transaction that we had, uh, that looks easy because uh, business logic can uh, roll back changes um, at any time, right? So um, a rollback statement will just uh, un undo the, all the changes that uh, has been done to the database. But it doesn't work for the saga because uh, we actually have a sequence of the local transactions. And in this case, we have sequence of them. Uh, mm -hmm. So for this case, uh, we, in, in the saga, we have um, compensating tr transactions. Uh, so basically for the, each of the transactions that we have in the uh, saga flow, we need to also have a second transaction, which is uh, called compensating. For example, in, in this case, we have an on different transactions that have been committed successfully. And then the next one 
fails. So in this case, we need to execute the compensating transactions in the reverse order uh, for each of the, of the of the successfully committed transactions. Um, as an example of such compensating transaction, can be like uh, if we are maybe um, charging the money from the uh, from the user, compensating transaction can can add uh, those money uh, money back. Or if um, if you're talking about our example with the order. Um, Compensation transaction can change the state of the order to uh, order cancelled. Um, so in this case, uh, if the transaction with uh, number four fails, accounting service needs to send in another event to the kitchen service queue with the message says uh, uh, with the message notification um, containing some information with uh, about the error. So the kitchen service can pull that message and apply the compensating transaction. So in this case, it might be the, the client a ticket, then send message to the consumer service. We don't need, we don't actually need to have any compensating transaction for the customer ver verification because basically it's just a get, uh, uh, get request to the database. So the consumer service just can just uh, send another uh, message to the order service queue to uh, cancel the order. Okay, so at this point we have, at some point, consistent, actually a consistent uh, service, uh, where uh, we make sure that all of the transactions are completed. In case of any exceptional situation, we have those compensating transactions. Um, so everything should be working fine. But uh, the question, the next, the next question is how to implement that. There are two po possible ways uh, or architecture designs of how to implement Saga. First one is choreography. Basically, each of the Saga's participants uh, is responsible uh, for the decision making. So uh, for example, if we get in back to the uh, example. The Sorry, I didn't hear that. OK, guys. Um, so in, in this case, for the transaction number four, um, if um, the transaction fails itself, accounts, accounts, uh, accounting service needs to know that where to put the, um, the message about the, um, the, the failure uh, next. So it, we, we actually keep in the saga logic inside of the services itself. So as you can, uh, as you can see here on the left example, service C knows that it, it needs to pull an event from the service A, and also it needs to uh, push that message um, to the service B after that. And the second option is to have a centralized service um, for the coordinated cycle logic. As you can see on the right screen, we have a um, separate uh, service, uh, which is responsible for that. So basically all of the services here just getting uh, comments and uh, getting requests from the orchestrator and then sending the response back to the back to it. Uh, so let's take a look um, at both of those approaches um, closer. Uh, so in the first case, again, we have the same uh, the same example for microservices. Uh, First thing you should notice that each of those microservices has um, its own queue, one for the order service, one for the consumer service, and for ticket service, and for the credit card events service, which is from the accounting service. Um, so as the first step, we are just sending an order event to the order queue from the order service, as you can see on the left here. Then we have three different services, consumer service, kitchen service, and accounting service actually pull in that data from the order events queue. Uh, for the consumer service, we need to verify consumer details. For the kitchen service, we need to create a ticket. And also for the accounting service, we have two different steps. Uh, cause to authorize the card, we actually need an information from the, well, not just from the order service, but also from the consumer service and the kitchen service. So first of all, of all at, the first, uh, at the step number four, we are creating a pending authorization here until we get a response from the consumer service and the kitchen service. And if everything works fine, at the step number six, we are approving a ticket, authorizing a card, and sending a request back to the 
uh, to approve the order. Um, so as you can see, we don't have any centralized place to co coordinate that logic. So consumer service needs to know that um, he needs to get a, it, it needs to get a, um, even from the order service. And uh, also if you can take a look at the accounting service, it's pulling messages from three different queues, which might be complicated in some cases, uh, maybe uh, in case we have like uh, more than uh, for the different microservices. Uh, and also in the in the exceptional case, uh, accounting service needs to know where to put the uh, error event error event next. Uh, so about some benefits and drawbacks. Um, so since we are using actually accused uh, event based architecture, we have a loose coupling. So um, actually participant just subscribe to the to the event uh, and to know anything about the other other services. So the, the main disadvantage here, as I mentioned, it's actually hard, hard to understand when you have a huge um, project with a lot of different microservices. Because um, yeah, as, as you can see here, county service needs to pull the, the data from three different queues and just uh, coordinate that logic inside in, in, inside the, the, the service itself. And also it is possible to have some cyclic dependencies between the services, because uh, um, yeah, actually each service coordinates where to put the, and the service next. Um, and the second approach is basically orchestration uh, sagas. Um, as you can see here, we also have um, the queues for each of the microservices here. Um, also, um, quick note here that in this example, we are having the other, uh, sorry, uh, Saga Orchestrator as a part of the other service, uh, but it can be a separate service. And that's um, up, 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 to, up to us. Um, uh, so the main difference here is you can see the second queue called create order Saga reply channel. And all of the microservices are just sending the response into one queue, send the response back to the orchestrate, uh, orchestrator. So, um, yeah, uh, as you can see here, uh, Saga Orchestrator first sends an event to the uh, consumer service through the queue to verify customers and then gets a response back to the uh, from the reply channel, then sends the same request to the kitchen service. Um, to create a ticket and get response back to the same reply channel. So the main um, benefit of this approach is actually uh, simple to understand because all of those microservices are just sending replies back um, to the same channel. And all of those uh, uh, microservices doesn't know anything about other uh, queues because they are just, uh, sending a response to a request from the orchestrator using its own uh, its own queue. Consumer service, just using the consumer service queue, kitchen service, kitchen service queue, and so on. Um, we have also the, the same um, benefit from using the event-based architecture that's uh, less coupling. And also uh, the last benefit, it actually improves separation of uh, concerns and simplifies the business um, uh, logic because um, each of those microservices are just respon uh, responsible for their work. They are not responsible for this coordination logic. Um, so it may um, yeah, simplify uh, development of, the, of those services. And one of the obvious um, drawback here is the risk of centralization because we have all of that coordination logic in one place. So it might be critical in, in, in some cases. Uh, so let's um, get back to the asset uh, that we discussed at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, so uh, yeah, and let's take a look um, on, on it through the um, point of microservices. So on Artemisity here, uh, we actually ensure that um, all the transactions are executed or the changes are done using the compensating transactions. And also since we're using the queues, we can also, we are not actually losing the messages. So there is a 
a guarantee that um, the transaction will be uh, executed or uh, rolled back. Uh, a quick, uh, sorry, a small remark here about the transactional messaging. If we can get back to the first example. Um, so it's okay, uh, and it's obviously that we can, um, that the local transaction will be committed or rolled back, but we also need to make sure that uh, two operations like saving in the database and sending an event to the queue is also has also atomicity. So to solve that issue, to make sure that we are uh, sending, uh, we are uh, saving uh, some data to the database and sending uh, a message to the queue. So we are doing that as a one operation, as a single unit. Um, there are uh, approaches called um, transactional messaging. That's not a point of this presentation, but um, there are two main uh, patterns let's say to solve that issue uh the, we can uh, yeah you can um, just check that um, if it will be a problem for you uh, the second one is consistency uh, so uh, again since we are using uh, the local databases uh, part of the consistency will be handled by by, by them and also we'll be keeping the cons uh, data consistent by handling that um, using the business logic for example uh, we have ended that order id we send in that order id to the queue then we pull in that order id from the queue and the saving in the internet and on the database uh, same for the durability because uh, if the transaction um, saga transaction uh, have been committed uh, to the databases and durability handled uh, is actually handled by uh, those local databases but uh, the open question is about the uh, uh, isolation here, because um, actually nothing stops us from um, just sending another request to the other service, um, to maybe to change the other state. And since uh, we are using just a bunch of local transactions, at this point, the first transaction may be committed, even if if the stack, the stack is still in progress. Uh, so at the first glance, uh, these problems looks like it's unworkable, actually. But in the most cases, uh, sorry, not the most cases, in some cases, uh, developers may ignore the isolation or reduce the isolation level to improve some performances, uh, per, uh, to improve performance of the of the service. And we can control that in our databases. No, I mean the isolation level. So the, the first question is, do we actually uh, need that isolation for, for your cases? Uh, if not, that's okay. We cannot just ignore that um, uh, that issue. If we actually um, need some isolation between the transactions using the saga, there are some approaches uh, called countermeasures here. Uh, which can deal with different um, types of anomalies uh, that we have, that we may have in the case of uh, a lack of, isolation, uh, lack of isolation. So the first and the most obvious approach will be the semantic lock. So basically we are creating a lock um, manually by using, for example, some flag in the record in, in the database saying that the transaction is still in progress. Uh, so the, the second transaction or the second, um, so just check uh, for that uh, flag first. Uh, but that's actually may lead to some com additional complication uh, logic because we also need to handle some deadlock uh, cases in case we have those logs into um, Two dependent tables, for example. Um, also, in some cases, we may have commutative updates. Uh, so basically, operations that may be executed in any order. So actually, in this case, we don't need isolation at all. For example, uh, debit and credit operations uh, are commutative at some point. Um, and also, uh, the last one, but not least, is um, the countermeasure called by value. Um, so 
in some cases, for example, when you have uh, maybe transact transactions with a huge amount of money, we may have it a we may need to, to make a decision if we actually need to use Saga. So we may, may actually combine two approaches in the in the services that we built. So in some cases, when it's not really critical, or as I remember I mentioned about the availability, if you have just two services um, that we need to to have a distributed transaction for, we just can use the simple traditional approach with the, with the XA compliant technologies and that's fine. But in the cases when we have like five, 10 different microservices, we can still use Saga. Uh, so yeah, that's a problem and that's an issue, but also there is some, as I mentioned, that's not all of the countermeasures. So uh, for your case, you may just try to, to find a solution for your case. There are a lot of them, but, but yeah, you should keep that in mind. So that probably you, uh, Saga not for you in your critical case. Uh, let's take a quick look at the example I want to show you. So here we have uh, orchestration-based Saga. We have three different databases, one for the payment service, one another one for the inventory service and for the order service. Uh, for this simple case, communication between uh, the order orchestrator and the payment service and the inventory service are done by, uh, actually through the HTTP calls. But in the bigger project, this should be made by uh, communication through the uh, event messaging. Uh, yeah, and here we have the, uh, actually that um, event-based communication from the service to the order orchestrator. So the main idea here, and what actually I want to show you, is that in case of any exceptional situation for the, from the payment service or the inventory service, <clears throat> uh, we'll be able to roll back the changes that we did. Uh, for example, if we have um, not enough money um, and we already uh, removed a, a, a product from from the inventory store, we are uh, uh, get that product back to the store and also um, yeah and also in the case of those ex exceptional situation we uh, also cancel the, the the order so let's take a look at the example also let me know if it's not too small for you to see i can uh, maybe make it bigger So as a first step here, we, I have a small Docker Compose file just to have uh, for the Kafka. Uh, and we have here four different uh, microservices and just one common uh, module for the uh, uh, common request and response objects. Um, let's take a look at the inventory um, service first. Also for this simple case, I'm just using the in memory data, just not to um, have like three different databases for the local case, but it should work the same. And we have a transaction that we need to deduct inventory. So basically buy a product where we are uh, uh, removing the quantity if user trying to just trying to buy that and that product. Um, yeah, this is a transaction. And for each of the transactions, as you remember, we need to, keep, to also have a compensating transaction, which is this one. So in case of any exceptional situation we get from the orchestrator, uh, we should increase the quantity of the products by one. Uh, similar logic we have for the payment service, because here we just keep in the product ID and the quantity of the project products and the set service related to the payment service we are keeping the uh, user and actual user uh, money uh, and balance of money, of money and the same idea here uh, when user tries to have to, to, to buy a product it, it needs to uh, it orchestrator calls the debit methods just to reduce the balance of, of, of that user and the same idea here we have another compensating transaction with exceptional case to get um, user's money money back. 
just two simple services uh, here. And let's take a look at the orchestrator next. Um, so I have uh, have here some uh, just helpers uh, just to organize this work in some workflows. So basically, for the work workflow, if you can uh, can can see here on the diagram. For each of the requests from the order service, we need to call payment service and inventory service. So basically we have two different steps. One for um, each of those services, inventory step and the payment step. We have some, as I mentioned, for this specific case, I'm using just an HTTP call. Um, vehicle uh, deduct uh, endpoint here in the norm normal case and the this um, reward case as a compensating transaction. And same for the payment step. Uh, we are um, debit money from the user's account in case every, if everything were, uh, works fine. And reward basically adds money back in case of the compensating transaction. If you take a look at the orchestrator service here, that's the main method, or, or, or orchestration methods here. Uh, so we basically get in the steps and exec executing them, basically calling the endpoints. And if everything is okay here, we just send in a request back to the Kafka queue, to the order service to make it, uh, to make that order completed. In case of any exceptional situation, for example, user doesn't have enough money to complete the order, or there, there are not enough uh, products in the store, we are sending an, um, basically calling uh, compensating transactions here. Um, same idea, we have workflow, basically the same. Uh, for, and for all of those services, we are calling the compensating transaction, which is actually here, the reward. Uh, and after that, after the compensating, uh, when we make sure that um, we actually rolled back all, all the changes from the inventory service and the a payment service. We are providing, sending back resp uh, the response to the order service to cancel the, 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 uh, the order. Um, yeah, and the last piece of this, um, this service is the order service itself. Yeah, having some small configuration for the Kafka that consume messages from the orchestrator and also to supply messages in case when we need to create an order. Sorry, may I ask, please? Yep. Uh, yeah, um, I don't know, but Kafka is also a distributed system, yes? And uh, will it be the best solution for Saga is Kafka? Because I mean about the deli delivery semantics for Kafka. Is it clear about the question? Uh, uh, I didn't get the second part because of the interruption. Um, could you repeat? that yeah sorry uh, as i know that the kafka is also a distributed system and uh, as i know that uh, for uh, i mean that uh, for the saga pattern uh will it uh, will it be the best solution is uh, to use kafka q i mean because for the kafka we need to um provide some delivery semantic i mean at most one for this case that's yeah so to not, to not of, miss to not miss some SAHA transaction, I mean. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I believe I mentioned that at some point in in the uh, in the presentation, but you are absolutely correct. It depends on on the requirements, right? Because uh, um, we were talking about the availability, about the atomicity of the transactions, uh, but in some cases it might be not a critical issue. Uh, so in general, just not just to make sure that we are not losing messages. That's a good uh, technology. That's a good approach uh, to use. But in some cases, that might be not really critical. And also, if we are talking about the AWS SQS, which is available for the ninety nine point and I believe eight nines after that, which is highly available service. So that in some cases also may be a, a good solution for that some cases okay thank you yeah um, um oh okay about the the, the order service itself um so th that's basically a simple service we just 
um, calling the, the orchestrator by emitting the, the, the event. And um, yeah, and that should be that should be it. Uh, let me show you some examples. So uh, as you remember, we have some uh, a few exceptional situations. For example, uh, for example, when a user doesn't have enough, enough money to create a, to create a product. Uh, let me open the postman for this case. So that's basically hard coded data in the in the memory right now, as I mentioned. But yeah, it should be in the databases. Uh, so let's try to buy a product with ID uh, ID two, which is basically cost two hundred here, and the full amount of money for this particular user is uh, one thousand. So let's try to um, create an order here. Mm -hmm. Okay, we need to start the service first. Okay. Okay, I forgot to mention about the statuses here. Uh, that's from the call. So uh, initially, in any case, when we just place the, um, when we execute the first transaction to create an order, it has the status order created. Then in case of any compensating transactions, uh, we're just changing that to the order ca canceled and in the happy pass i'm changing that to the order completed and since i'm using for this example redux um, it just provides the, uh, the response back immediately without waiting for the uh, i got to complete but we can use the endpoint to get uh, current orders and we can see that the status is uh, completed and the more 200 so at this point we should have like 800 left so let's try to create a few more so at this point we should have four different orders is the state order completed and the result amount should be um, i mean the amount that um, that's left um, also 200 because we have four for uh, for 200 and that means that 200 left. So let's try to buy the, the, buy, uh, the order with the, with the price of 300. We also get an uh, order created state because of the uh, reason I mentioned. But if it, we'll take a look at the example here, they have that order canceled. Because uh, we don't have enough uh, money to pay. And since we have executed the compensating transaction, we should provide that money back to the to the user. So it should still, in the case when the order cancels, should still have those 200. And let's try to buy again uh, another order with a price, another product with a price 200. Okay, we can see that the order is complete. So at this point we have zero amount of money. So for each of the next orders uh, we are trying to purchase, we'll get the canceled order. Okay. Um, basically that's it from my side. Uh, do you have any questions about the presentation or the example itself? Hi, uh, thank you very much, firstly, for this presentation. I actually learned a lot. I uh, just want to ask, is there a possibility that uh, we can have access to the presentation and maybe even 
uh, to see the the services, the code, because it's really helpful and it was very good. So. Um, yeah, so the question is, uh, yes, about the presentation. I just want to add another slide with some useful links because I was reading, I was actually reading a, um, a book about the design pa patterns that, uh, about, uh, for the microservices in general, which is maybe useful for you guys. So I'll add another slide here with some, um, yeah, um, different links. And also about the uh, code example, I will create uh, a Git repo for that. I'm just not sure, should I use my personal GitHub account or so? So I'll discuss that uh, with, uh, I discussed that and probably you'll provide that information for you after the Yeah, yeah, well, event. After, after event, maybe after one day, uh, you will receive um, a follow-up with a useful link with um, this presentation and video. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. It was very helpful. Thank Maybe you. someone has questions. <laughs>